Good day. Um, my name is Dennis Allison. I'm hosting uh, EE380, uh, the Stanford uh, uh, Computer Systems uh, uh, Colloquium. Uh, today's uh, speakers are Damon McCoy and Laura Edelson. They're at NYU where they're doing work in, uh, well, the internet and all the things that come along with it. Um, in any case, uh, you're on. Um, you know, I, I very interested in hearing what you've been doing and how the how the work has been proceeding. Hi, Dennis. Great to meet you. Uh, my name is Laura Edelson. Um, my name is Dan McCoy. Oh, yes, there he is. And I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so I'd like to talk to you today about user trust attacks in digital political advertising. But first, just want to introduce who we are and why we work in this area. So Damon and I work in the NYU uh, Cybersecurity Lab. We are an interdisciplinary center focused on researching technical and other means to, to secure the cyber infrastructure and to shape public discourse on the policy and legal aspects of cybersecurity. So we've been studying some of the problems around information attacks and user trust attacks in digital political advertising since 2018. And we've published uh, at least some preliminary results looking at the security of Facebook's um, ad library for ads on social issues, elections and politics, as well as some overviews of the three major transparency archives from Facebook, Google, and Twitter. So what I'd like to talk to you today are just about what user trust attacks in digital political advertising look like, how they've been evolving, and what some potential solutions might be. So let's just start by answering the question of what a user trust attack in po digital political advertising actually is. So we think it has a few hallmarks. These attacks exploit users' trust in their social networks and institutions. They promote false beliefs. They often seek to motivate a specific action or inaction on the part of the user. And they are usually narrowly targeted to users who would be most susceptible to the network of trust being exploited and to evade detection by watchdogs and users not part of that trust network. So let's take these points in turn. So first, exploiting user trust in existing social networks and institutions. So advertisers do this in several ways. Advertisers might pretend to share a, network, a metric of identity with the user. They might pre pretend to share a geographic location uh, to pretend that they're a neighbor, basically. They might pretend to be part of a trusted institution like a local newspaper. And occasionally advertisers simply exploit users' trusts in the offices that that advertiser might hold. So this is an example of advertisers explaining trust in, in uh, metrics of identity. So these are ads that ran in 2018. Um, the New American Media group was and was a political consultancy that set up Facebook groups and pages around different metrics of identity. So these three, Melanin was aimed at African Americans, Raising Tomorrow was aimed at young parents, the Soldiers Network was aimed at veterans. They then uh, promoted political content out to all of these networks that had initially been set up as these sort of apolitical groups. Uh, this is an example of uh, geographic targeting. So in this case, this was a network of um, sort of, these were pages that were set up to look like they were local news uh, outlets. They were set up across five swing states or at least swing states in 2018. And they, again, they promoted sort of centralized political content out to all of these local pages. Um, this is, this is uh, another local news approach. This one is less uh, news and more local. So where the last one, they were really pretending to be 
local news outlets. These were just focused around these pages, um, which was set up by a political consultant in 2020. I believe they set up about 13 of these pages that were, you know, uh, local metro area or local state proud. And again, promoted all this um, political content intermingled with content that was specific to that geographic area. Although this one doesn't have quite that news focus. Okay, so um, the next part that we look for is the promotion of false beliefs. So what do we mean by promoting false beliefs? Because I think very often this is, um, this is often lumped in with misinformation and sometimes it is it's misinformation that's that's you know very simple information that's just factually incorrect but very often we find content that may not make a explicitly false statement um, but it promotes false beliefs in other ways so we see a lot of content that is uh, just asking the question and also content that has threatening but non-specific claims and something I want to call out about what I'm about to show you is um, sometimes the false beliefs that are being promoted are really only tangential to the advertiser goal. And it can be a mistake to advertise, to, um, to conflate the message being promoted with the advertiser's goal. So let's take a look through some of the things we've seen. So here are some ads that promote the false belief that um, mail-in voting is just rife with fraud. So protect my vote on the left. These ads were actually aimed at um, African-American users in um, Midwestern swing states. Chicks on the right, this one was aimed at conservatives. Here are some ads uh, promoting the false belief that leftist mobs are um, wreaking violence on the suburbs. So the one in the upper left is actually from a uh, candidate for Congress. He was uh, in this video, he will tell you that there are looting hordes coming into the Georgia suburbs from Atlanta. Um, this middle, this uh, middle ad is doing a good job of just asking the question whether catastrophic mass fires are being deliberately set uh, by Biden voter firebugs. And in the, on the, on the right hand side, you know, again, we're just asking the question if the left will violently respond if Amy Coney Barrett is appointed to the Supreme Court. So lastly, um, I've got an example of what is fairly straightforward um, false information. So these ads promote the, uh, the false idea that Joe Biden uh, has a policy position on banning fracking. Um, and this is sort of an interesting example of, of, again, exploiting user trust in their social networks, because while the advertiser America First Action is a pack, they are making these statements through the mouth of, um, you know, Sean, a union man and Democrat, and Brian, a third generation oil and gas man. So moving on. Um, while we often talk about these kinds of user trust attacks through a lens that is explicitly related to an election, and, and it certainly is used often to motivate users to, uh, to not vote or to vote. Um, actually, when we, when we look at these kinds of attacks more generally, we see a lot of ads that are commercially motivated. So um, sometimes, this commercial motivation is a little hard to show very explicitly because it's tied to, for example, political commentators who make really outlandish uh, and false attacks, um, and their goal is to increase their own viewership and, and subscriber base. That's certainly one way that, um, that some of these attacks are commercially motivated. But actually, there's a lot that have a very, very clear cut uh, commercial path. So just to show you a few of these, um, this was the, these are the ads from the uh, page Stop Mandatory Vaccination that are spreading the false belief that uh, measles vaccines are dangerous. Um, what they really want to get you to do is to buy their, uh, nutri uh, their nutraceuticals and their books about um, vaccine harm. Here's some ads about Trump Care for America. Uh, these are actually selling these, uh, they're not 
they're not actually legally health insurance. They are health plans. Um, these are actually under federal investigation right now, this company. Um, here's another one, Tax Blueprint. These are promoting the false belief that, uh, you know, a wave of foreclosures is coming due to the coronavirus. And what they're actually selling is um, this get rich quick scheme. So, you know, we also, you know, we see this tactic being pretty widely used. And in general, it's usually not that hard to find a very specific action that they are, that uh, these advertisers are trying to motivate. So getting onto the last hallmark, that these user trust attacks do need to be carefully targeted in order to be effective. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how our project gets at targeting data, but just to give you an example of this, um, Donald Trump ran an ad that promoted the uh, false belief that uh, Joe Biden was gonna defund 911. This ad, was uh, or in this this ad in this claim do you have a false fact check but because facebook allows candidates to run ads with false information this ad was not removed but we can see uh that this ad was targeted specifically to it was specifically targeted to suburban married women so in this case this ad was shown to um you know to women in maine and uh, we have other instances of this ad shown in other suburbs, but basically always to um, married women. So a big part of why this ad targeting is so important is that ads that are shown outside of the uh, trust network that they are trying to exploit have so much less credibility. It's just much easier to, um, you know, to see through an ad when it isn't exploiting your uh, community. And also, we do know that um, watchdogs need to be able to get at all of these ads that contain falsehoods in order to debunk them and warn their communities about them. So that's what we see uh, user trust attacks looking like right now, but I wanted to talk just briefly about how these attacks have evolved and where we, you know, where we sort of think we've gotten to at this point, and then we'll start to talk about solutions. So I just wanted to quickly show you what I'm sure you're familiar with, um, but here's some Russian disinformation that ran on Facebook during the 2016 election. So here's an ad. Um, uh, promoting uh, this idea that Bernie Sanders uh, won with help from Arab and Muslim Americans. Um, here's a, you know, a sort of an, an anti-Hillary Clinton ad. Here's an ad um, promoting, uh, you know, supporting the, this was part of the Back the Blue movement. Uh, this is an ad uh, organizing a protest against Donald Trump for the African American community. Here's another one promoting this conspiracy theory that uh, Bill Clinton had an out of wedlock love child. Um, here's another one for support for supporters of the Second Amendment. Here's one for the uh, promoting the African American community. And what I really want to point out here is all of these ads, in one way or another, are aimed at users within a specific trust network. Some of these are aimed at African Americans, like this ad for the, um, you know, promoting the Bill Clinton conspiracy theory. That was aimed very specifically at African American uh, users. Some of these other ads promoting the, the Back the Blue and the Defend the Second Amendment ads, those were aimed at, um, you know, rural working class whites. So there's a real range of networks and a range of messaging, because again, the messaging is very often not the goal. So um, just looking and just to give a very brief over, overview of what we've seen over the past four years. In 2016, you know, I just showed you some examples of the Russian IRA polarization campaigns. I'm sure everyone is also familiar with the, you know, the fake news campaigns that we saw in 2016. So I think the first thing that took hold domestically within the United States were some of those fake news attacks. So we did see some of that taking place in 2018. 
uh, but it did tend to be focused on specific candidates where there was an attempt to smear specific, uh, usually congressional candidates with fake news. It didn't seem to work too well, um, but it was absolutely tried again in uh, several elections in 2019. Um, we have really good documentation of what happened in the EU election 2019 of these kinds of fake news campaigns. It certainly took place in several other countries as well uh, that we don't have quite as good documentation of like Australia and um, Malaysia. Um, but what we've been seeing in 2020 is really widespread engagement by US domestic political actors, a little bit in that fake news uh, category of attack. But what we are really seeing is many, many advertisers embracing this idea of strongly polarizing political campaigns via these tools of, you know, taking on a mantle of, um, of user trust via one of these methods I've described, and also promoting false beliefs that are maybe not tied to a specific fact pattern of a particular candidate, but maybe more amorphous around these kinds of ideas around leftist mobs or you know, widespread mail-in ballot fraud are the ones we're seeing. So um, just a couple of points I wanted to make about, you know, about how these attacks have evolved. Um, first is that Online platforms are certainly a megaphone for these kinds of attacks, but they're not the source of the problem. The source of the problem is often, you know, an offline, there's some kind of offline source. And the um, these attacks, when they are, are pushed out on these digital platforms, are usually part of a multi-pronged, multi-platform attack. For example, in 2016, the uh, you know the Russian IRA efforts on Facebook would not have been nearly as effective if they were not done in concert with a hack and dump of um, you know democratic emails that were then leaked to the media through a variety of sources. It was a you know it was a broad attack that was able to polarize because um, it was multi pronged, um, but online platforms do amplify some messages more than others. They uh, the algorithms that promote content on many of these, uh, you know, online platforms tend to promote the most engaging content. And what we have found is that when it comes to politics, uh, more in polarizing, more enraging content is also more engaging. And that's a problem. So getting to solutions. And for this, I'm going to hand off to Damon McCoy, who will talk us through some of the solutions that we're finding some promise with and some that we're still exploring. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about some of the solutions that our group has been trying to come up with. And again, a lot of these are very preliminary. This is a very hard problem that you know will be probably the focus of study for years to come to figure out how to actually tackle some of these problems. And so the main solution that our group has been focusing on is this you know, idea of transparency with NIR. And to begin with, I'm just gonna kind of break down. When I say transparency, right, this is kind of this broad overarching goal, but in order to make transparency real, it takes some you know, specific components of the transparency to ideally make it as effective as possible. And right, as with much of you know, cybersecurity or computer science in general, right, it all begins with policies <laughs> within here. And so right, these transparency um, initiatives have to be backed by some kind of policy within here. Ideally, right, that policy will require advertisers to you know, make clear to the platforms in the users you know, some specific set of things that will then help you know, those users and other people that are making use of this transparency better understand you know, what is being made transparent, in this case, political advertising within here. Then once there's some reasonable set of policies in place, the next thing is right the actual realization, the actual implementation of this transparency. It needs to be backed with some actual technical implementation you know, by the platforms. They need to build some products, some systems that are able to disclose the relevant information and that can right, disseminate this information both to end users and to third parties that want to make use of this transparency within here. 
And so then we have this policy, we have the implementation of this policy, but then, right, the security component, you always need some kind of enforcement. Because if you have a policy without any enforcement, it's normally not that worthwhile within your. And so right, the platforms need to build up some kind of enforcement where they're able to both recognize and ideally you know, have in place some penalties for advertisers that want to try and evade the transparency requirements of the platform within here. So these are kind of generically, as we see it, the three you know, basic building blocks of transparency. Now I'm going to kind of go into a more concrete example of how this looks for Facebook in terms of their political and social issue transparency that they've built around their platforms. And to begin with, um, this they began doing this, um, you know, after right all of the stuff with the Russians and election interference came to light. They went to the Senate and they promised transparency for their political advertising. And then they quickly expanded that to also include social issue ads as well within here. And Facebook's policy has, at least in the US, in other countries, the rules differ. Um, mandatory disclosure and transparency of what they deem to be social issue election and policy ads. And to the credit, this is actually a fairly inclusive policy that captures a lot of what we feel you know, is political content within here. And then the next part of their transparency policy is again, this is mandatory. So advertisers are vetted and then they're required to provide an accurate disclosure string naming the entity that paid for the ad. And it has to conform to certain standards that Facebook has laid out within here. Again, a fairly reasonable policy within here. Um, unfortunately, one thing that Facebook did do is that news publishers did not like that their ads were being flagged as political just because you know, they wrote an article on a political topic within here. And so um, Facebook right, likes to provide good customer service to their advertisers and they built out an exemption for news publishers within here. So this is a loophole in the transparency where if a news publisher managed to get on this exemption list, they don't have to um, disclose their ads to this transparency system within here. They won't appear within here. And this is a loophole, right, that's being actively exploited as we can see. So, right, so there's this whole issue around what is a legitimate news publisher within here. And right, again, the news publishers, some of the partisan ones are pushing the boundaries as to how partisan they can be and still get the exemption so that they don't have to do the transparency requirements. The other thing, with this is right, what is actually made transparent within here. So the you know the creatives, images, videos, the text of the ad, the disclosure string of who paid for it, the page that it's connected to are all made transparent. However, the transparency does not include the actual targeting criteria that the advertiser set when they purchase the ad within here. Now, if we look at the transparency of Facebook's, or sorry, the implementation of Facebook's transparency, initially they rolled out a web portal. The web portal, um, this was actually the motivation for why we started to do this work in the first place, is that the web portal contained a lot of data, but that data was very hard to access. Basically, it was built for a manual investigation of ads. So if you wanted to ask a simple question, say like, who is the, you know, the advertiser spending the most money on political ads on Facebook's platforms? That question was very difficult to answer through this web portal within here. And so um, shortly afterwards, we kind of pushed Facebook to implement an API within here. And they implement this API. Unfortunately, this API is, you know, fairly hard to use within here. Um, you know, they had to roll it out very quickly, so it's buggy. Um, it wasn't really designed with the use case of you know, collect all the data in Facebook's transparency system within here. So we've essentially had to hire a full-time engineer just to simply get you know, a complete view of the data from Facebook's transparency implementation. Then after the API, they started to publish these transparency reports 
within here. These transparency reports include the disclosure string, how many ads were purchased by that disclosure string, how much that disclosure string spent within here. And they have these you know, monthly, weekly, and daily reports within here. Um, Facebook only makes available the most recent reports in each category. They, they don't provide you know, archives of older reports and analysis that um, our team has done, particularly Laura did a lot of this analysis, shows that the spending information is oftentimes inaccurate within these reports. Um, we went to Facebook with these inaccuracies and to their credit, they, they regenerated specific reports where we found inaccuracies in these reports. However, they haven't made it a policy that when they have inaccuracies to you know, recompute these reports so that they become accurate within here. So sometimes we find very large spending irregularities, say like $4 million appears one day and then disappears the next day from these transparency reports within here, which makes it frustrating to try and deal with this inaccurate data that's being provided. The next thing within here of their implementation is that they provide um, spending and impression information, but they bucket it within here. And unfortunately, sometimes these buckets are relatively large. Facebook has been making these buckets slightly smaller these days, which is good, but still um, a lot of the ads are in that smallest bucket, essentially zero to $99 being spent within here. So most of the ads are fairly small, and so they end up in that smaller, that smallest bucket within here. Facebook also provides um, reach data. So the state that the impressions were shown in and you know, um, gender and age demographics of it. But again, they don't provide the targeting information. And we've also found through our analysis, um, Laura found that, right, that Facebook can remove content from the ad library. So this was something that if you read their website, they said that they would include all these ads for seven years. However, we found them, they've done several waves of removal of ads within here. So as an example, um, in this one year period spanning you know, 2018 to 2019, um, we estimated that about 8,000 ads were removed from the ad library, composing about 0.2% of the total within here. So this shows a big need for you know, some third parties, such as ourselves, to archive these ads in case some of them are later deleted by Facebook within here. The next thing that we studied in our research was in terms of the transparency enforcement within here. And we found that unfortunately, you know, Facebook's um, enforcement was somewhat spotty. Their enforcement happens in two waves. The first enforcement is when the ad is placed within there. Unfortunately, we can't see what ads are rejected at this phase of the enforcement since they're never made transparent. Um, but the ones that are accepted and run on the platform and then later get caught are then placed into the transparency. They don't include a disclosure string for these within here. Even if the advertiser had previously provided one, they don't attach that to the ads that they catch that weren't properly disclosed. And we found, um, again, in this one year time period, that about 10% of the ads in the library were not disclosed at the time of creation and later caught within here. Um, we'll go more into detail about this later, but right, these are just the ones that Facebook catches. There's, you know, as we found, there's ones that Facebook doesn't catch as well. The final thing is that based on our analysis, it doesn't appear that Facebook has you know, penalties at the advertiser level oftentimes. So we saw advertisers that were able to spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, running you know, a large number of ads undisclosed and they were able to keep running these ads over and over violating Facebook's transparency policy and Facebook didn't seem to penalize the advertiser at least in any visible way that we could see within here. So this is kind of a rundown of these things within Facebook system. Also as part of our research we tried to propose some improved enforcement techniques within here. We developed this algorithm that could detect um, what we called kind of undisclosed coordinating pages within here. 
and I'll just quickly go through the algorithm. So the algorithm begins with the, um, the page name, the disclosure string, and the text of the ad. At the time of this research, we couldn't programmatically access the images, so we couldn't use those as part of our algorithm within here. Since then, Facebook has, to their credit, made the images programmatically accessible, at least most of them. Um, and so we take this text and we run it through the sim hashing algorithm. The idea of the sim hashing algorithm is that it produces a hash where the text you know, is um, similar than the sim hash value will also be similar within here. So it basically kind of gives us a rough edit distance between two texts that will be close if in the sim hash space within here. And so um, you can tune the sim hash with different values to accept you know, if the text only have say like three differences, they'll sim hash to the same value within there. And so we tune the sim hash to accept, you know, have some tolerance in terms of differences. And then we found the ones where the sim hash was the same within here. And for the ones with the sim hash that was the same, these were basically, you know, we considered these to be a cluster of ads. And then we looked at the pages and disclosure strings involved in these ads within here. And if we found that you know it was the same text, but it was you know, being run by different pages or different disclosure strings, we considered this to be suspicious within here. And we mark these as likely undisclosed coordinated pages within here. We then manually reviewed these, and I won't have time to really go into this, but we found a few different you know, categories of these types of undisclosed coordinating pages within here. Probably the most um, troubling of these is what we call the inauthentic communities, where, you know, right, presumably, you know, a single entity was creating multiple communities. Similar to what Laura was saying, those attacks, you know, they might be location-based, identity-based, or some of that, and then they were pushing out the same messages to all those different groups within there. And they were not correctly disclosing that they were all from that same entity within there. And they were oftentimes, you know, incorrectly disclosing the ads within there. So this was a theoretical algorithm. We ran it, um, and ideally Facebook would implement it if they so choose within here. But right, again, we don't have control over Facebook's platform. So we tried to use this idea of clustering and build kind of a third party system that could work outside of Facebook's system. And we called this, you know, with the goal of trying to help civil society groups in screening ads within here. And the, the quick idea of the system is that we, right, we cluster ads that are similar and we essentially call these like ad campaigns. We do it based on the text and the image of the ad. And then we present the users of the system with you know, a single um, object that represents that ad campaign that shows the aggregate of that ad campaign. And so now, right, instead of, you know, sometimes these campaigns have like thousands of individual ads that are all part of you know, a single ad campaign within here. So this makes it much more tractable for these civil society groups to go through and review these ad campaigns and then mark the ones that they believe to be program problematic for their particular communities. So um, we, right, we've, we've partnered with several civil society groups. Again, these civil society groups are really key to making this work, because right, as computer scientists, cybersecurity experts, we don't oftentimes understand the threats that are facing these specific communities within here. And so without that understanding of what specific threats, there's no way that we could actually find them within here. But again, this domain expertise of these civil society groups, they, right, they, they have that domain expertise to know what the threats are and to identify them in the system within here. So we're leveraging their domain expertise through the system within here, having them flag the ads. Right now, we don't do a lot with the flagging. The goal in the future is to use some kind of you know, machine, learn, machine learning model to hopefully kind of recommend or rank campaigns better so that the ones that you know, our model believes are potentially problematic kind of are the first ones that they review within the system. So this is kind of a future goal of this ad screening system within here. The next system that we built was this website that we call the NYU Ad Observatory. The goal of this website was to try and, um, you know, organize the transparency information and turn it from raw data into actual 
information. Ideally, this tool is, um, this website is focused at journalists, in particular local journalists that oftentimes can't afford the data science expertise or you know, the graphic design expertise to analyze this data within here. And so they can go to this website and right, we, we map out all the spending by state, by state races, by sponsors. And so they can go through this data and this is all through the Creative Commons license. And so they can simply you know, screenshot what they're seeing on the website and include it in their articles if they wish within here. And this has been highly successful. I think I've lost count. Um, you know, at least 10, 20, 30 um, articles by local journalists have been written using this data. And also um, more major, you know, national news outlets have used this data as well to help inform the reporting. However, one big limitation of all of this is that we're dependent on the data, again, that Facebook, you know, catches and makes transparent to their system. And as our, you know, analysis and our research showed, this was incomplete. And so we built another tool called Ad Observer within here. And the goal of Ad Observer was to get an independent source of data of you know, advertising on Facebook's platform, in particular political advertising within here. And so Ad Observer is a browser plugin that volunteers can choose to install. And it does not collect any personal user data within here. All that it collects and the users essentially donate to science are the ads that they're seeing and the targeting information that Facebook isn't making transparent within there. And so through this alternative source of data, we can start to find the ads that Facebook never caught and never made transparent. So this is through our ad observatory website, we've connected this data source and we can show these ads like this NRA ad, this Joe Biden ad that Facebook did not catch and make transparent within the system. So this exposes at least some of the ads that Facebook is missing within their system. And again, we also get the targeting information so that we can use this to enrich our understanding of advertising as well. So these are all you know, preliminary steps towards transparency. A lot of this is focused at Facebook. Ideally, we can expand this to other platforms like YouTube and things like that in the future within here. And we can keep building on and keep experimenting and learning how to make transparency more useful to all of these different stakeholders. And the most challenging one is end users within here. We haven't really addressed that one much yet. Um, this is kind of, we consider this to be more of a short-term solution within here. Ideally, there's some more longer-term solutions. A lot of these might um, require more of a redesign of these systems within here. Um, one of the ideas that we have is, right, Facebook and other platforms have decided that you know their customers are always right <laughs> within here and so um ideally they will you know learn about the problems that this kind of mindset and policy creates and they will you know make the decision or perhaps regulation will step in and make the decision that you know some ad should not be run in the system if you know of the particular type that Laura was showing before if right they're factually incorrect or if they're you know, trying to undermine the democratic process as a whole within here. Um, ideally, the platforms could you know, um, allow the users more control over the content that they see within their platform. So right, if advertisers say, you know, or excuse me, users don't wanna see you know, any ads or particular types, say like conspiracy theory ads, or organic content, they can simply just say to the platforms like Facebook, do not show me anything that you suspect is conspiracy theory related within here. And the same could go, maybe, you know, they don't like cats. And so they say, do not show me any cat content within there, although who doesn't like cats? Um, and then, right, again, the platform can kind of do better prioritization of things, perhaps, you know, to not, um, advantage extreme political content as much as it's currently advantaged on their platform within here. And so with that, that's pretty much um, the solutions that we're currently exploring and the ones that we think should be explored in the future. It's an, it's an amazing amount of work you guys have been doing. I'm, uh, I'm really impressed. Uh, what do you do about, what do you do about natural language though? That's, that's, that's of course, 
uh, difficult. You're working with text and, and photographs. Uh, the photographs you can do a little bit of uh, uh, image analysis on, but not much that's really critical. We do a lot of textual uh -huh. analysis. Yeah. So um, one of the things that we do as part of how we uh, first we cluster and then organize information for screening system users to do is we classify all ads by their topic. So in order to do that, we obviously have to analyze the text. Um, in addition to that, we also extract named entities uh, because we find that that can also provide signal for both understanding topics and also understanding um, particular risk factors. Mm -hmm. So um, all ads, we, we have an analysis pipeline that all ads go through where we, you know, it's a fair, we, do, we, do, we do some fairly standard natural language processing uh, approaches where we, you know, we evaluate the text, we pull out named entities, um, we do that topic classification. We also use the text to, um, we have a politicalness, it's actually a regression model um, with, a, with a hard cutoff um, that we use for various things. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally what we're doing is trying to understand the content of ads in order to do some of these other risk evaluations and, um, and just groupings. Mm -hmm. And you you also cluster ads. That's the thing that's most interesting is that you, you are actually clustering but you, only within the Facebook platform. You don't try to correlate against uh, ads on Twitter or uh, Instagram or something like that. We're actually planning on doing that next. So um, I think this year we really focused on Facebook because they are certainly the 800 pound gorilla in online disinformation, but we think that um, as, as both Damon and I alluded to, these are cross-platform problems and the most successful campaigns do exist in, in multiple spaces. So we think that the next thing we need to tackle is taking some of the algorithms we've developed here and applying them to, you know, to cross-platform content. Mm -hmm. oh, amazing, amazing piece of work. Um, and you know it, it it applies it applies much more broadly than just the the ad space. I as we were talking before we started here, we we're talking about the the news space, which uh, is in many ways uh, very similar to the ad space, and it's difficult to differentiate the two sometimes. And it's going to be uh, very difficult to um, well, I don't know. The internet seems to die on truth these days because you don't really know what's real and what's not. Uh, later, later on today, I'm, I'm uh, talking with uh, an artist in Palo Alto who uh, makes uh, uh, videos of um, people in uh, uh, high places, uh, like the, uh, the uh, CEO at uh, Facebook, uh, saying things that they would never say, but doing it in a way where it is um, transparent and obvious that it's he's saying it and it's not, it's a, it's a fake. So, you know, the presence of fakes everywhere is getting to be, uh, make uh, just simply navigating uh, transparently a difficult, I mean, transparency is a place to start, but it's not going to be enough. Um, we're going to have to have better cross-checking in, in different ways. But anyhow, just re I'm really impressed. I think I think you've done very very interesting work, and um, you know it's uh, unfortunate that it's uh, it, it has to be done, but it's getting to be um, getting to be the uh, the requirement for uh, for survival in our age. Do you think there's a reasonable uh, future for the internet? The um, if you if you if you look at uh, some of the the groups in Europe and in the, and in Australia and such, uh, there are people who are adamant against uh, any invasion of privacy, adamant against the use of cryptography, adamant, adamant in many ways against privacy in, in the whole. Um, I'm, I'm very optimistic for the future. I, you know, I do think that, you know, so one of the problems that I think our community is having with this particular problem is there is a real struggle with some of the 
some of the core principles that I think are, are really intrinsic to the internet, like free speech, like freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we're running up against is things like QAnon, where, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I am just as much in favor of free speech and free expression as, as, as most other people are, but that is a, but QAnon is a, is a pattern of belief that has gotten people killed. And I think that there's a, there's a place where, you know, when you want to put principles into practice, you need to do it with an element of common sense. And so, you know, and, and that's why we really try to try to lay out things like, you know, false beliefs with a profit motive with some kind of, you know, with other false things, because any one of these things in isolation aren't necessarily harmful. Yeah. But I think, you know, I think we can say like, Look, there's there's plenty of there's plenty of fiction out there that nobody gets hurt, but we can also we can also say, look, we can also have some common sense and draw some lines where people will get hurt. I think you're right, and go to it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you very much. We appreciate your uh, your time and effort, and uh, uh, wish you the very best in the in your future research. And uh, we certainly will keep in touch. Thanks so much.